Thank you so much for everyone's patience while we sorted out a little bit of tech issues this morning. It's so great to have everyone here. Um, welcome to our schools joining us live. It's nice to see you as well. We have a few joining us over on YouTube. Um, I do have a few trivia questions for us to do while we while we wait uh, for possibly a couple late schools. So we are going to go ahead and do those I trivia do questions. Have a few trivia questions for us to do while we. Sorry, um, we're going to do those couple trivia questions just to make sure that everybody has access to the poll functions and we're all able to to uh, see that pop up on our computer. So feel free to answer those all as a class. So my first trivia question for everyone is when is Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? So you should see a little option pop up on your screen um, to our presenter, uh, presenter, Patricia, you're welcome to answer as well. Um, so you guys can go ahead and try, check with your class, see what they think. Is it July 1st? Is it today, September 29th? Tomorrow, September 30th? Or is it November 11th? When do we think is our National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? And I do want to say um, good morning and welcome. I know we are live on YouTube as well, so it's nice to see you. If you're joining us from YouTube, feel free to type your answers in the YouTube chat, and my colleague Sarah will send them over to us as well. Okay, I see we have some answers here. Clearly, we all know this one. We're here for Reconciliation Day. Uh, we chose C, September 30th. That's correct. So awesome job on that one. I started with an easy one. So we'll try a bit of a trickier one now. What is the purpose for the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation? Is it to learn about the history and legacy of residential school systems? Is it to celebrate Canada's independence? To celebrate Indigenous culture? or to commemorate the signing of the treaties. So why do we have a National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in Canada? What do we think? Now, if uh, your students can't quite uh, choose, you might just have to go with whichever one is the more common one. Do you wanna type a few other guesses in, the chat, uh, guesses in the chat as well? We can see those ones too. Okay, once again, everybody thinks it is a, to learn about the history and legacy of residential schools. That is correct. Okay, let's try the next one. How many treaties are currently recognized within Canada? Um, so I have a little bit of a picture here. I tried not to show all of Canada, so hopefully it didn't uh, give away the answer. Um, do we think there's 32, 57, 70, or 112? Now this one, I wasn't sure about this one either until I looked it up. I see we've got a few different answers. We've got some C's, some A's, some D's. Ooh, this one is the hardest one for sure. Okay, I'll just give you a few more seconds here. All right, so for this one, the correct answer is actually C. There are 70 recognized treaties within Canada. Okay, and we have one more trivia question. Well, um, we just get everything set up here, and this is, which event helped create Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? So there's an, an event that happened that, that created this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Was it the signing of the Paris Agreement? Was it findings from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Was it the signing of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Or was it the creation of the internet? So which of these activities sparked the, the launch of Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? Okay, just a few more seconds on this one. Lots of Bs and Cs. Awesome. A lot of us are thinking Bs and Cs. So although this is a human rights issue, it was actually sparked by the findings from the TRC. So those 94 calls to action from uh, survivors and their family members from the residential school system. So thank you so much for participating in those polls. It's awesome to see that we're all able to access them. During our live event, if you have any questions that you would like to ask or any comments, feel free to type them in the chat. I have access to the chat. Our speaker has access to the chat as well. So it's a really easy way to get our attention if there's something you would like to share during our live event. So making sure we're all in the right place. This is National Day for Truth and Re Reconciliation. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started with the live event. I know we're a couple minutes behind schedule and it's a pretty full event. So we're just going to jump right into it. So first off, I'd like to acknowledge where I'm joining from. So I'm joining from Amiskwachewa Skykan. This is colonially known as Edmonton, Alberta, and we're on Treaty 6 territory. 
It's a, it's a traditional gathering place and traveling route to many peoples, including the Cree, Suto, Blackfoot, Métis, the Diné, and the Nakota Sioux. And since we're joining on a virtual platform, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the traditional territories that you are all joining from across Turtle Island and around the world. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral unceded territory of all of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Now, reconciliation is not just an action that you can check off with a land acknowledgement or wearing an orange shirt once a year. It's a really long and difficult journey that we as Canadians must embark on together. I wanna to thank everyone for joining us today for taking an active role in the reconciliation process in your school and community. And I hope that after hearing Patricia's story today, you're inspired to take more steps in this difficult journey towards improving relationships between nations and to improving your own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Now, just a little heads up of what the event is gonna look like. We did save a little bit of time at the end um, for your questions and comments. So it's super helpful if um, you teachers can work with your class and maybe write down a couple questions during the presentation so we have them ready to go at the end. Of course, if it's a burning question or a comment, you can type it in the chat, um, but we will save a little bit of time for a facilitated discussion when we get to the end. Um, and I did wanna give a quick shout out to all of our schools that are joining us. Now, some of you are joining us live on this Zoom call. Um, some are going to be joining later on YouTube, but we have lots of schools across Canada and a few international as well. Um, so hopefully you can see your, your name up there and, and thanks for joining us today. All right, I would like to go ahead and welcome our speaker. So P Patricia St. Denis is a Muskeg Nehio Esquo from Cumberland House. And I hope I said that properly. You can let me know. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, is a Cree nation in the Treaty 5 territory, which is the birthplace of her mother. She has raised a big family and is blessed with three grandchildren. Patricia comes from a family of teachers and is herself in her 25th year in education. Currently, she is the Senior Director of Education for Meadow Lake Tribal Council. MLTC is situated in Northern Saskatchewan and serves four Diné communities and five Cree communities. Patricia enjoys supporting education and feels connected to the nine communities that she helps serve. Land, language, relationships, and culture is very important to her. LLRC is what grounds her in her personal life and work life. Patricia is excited to spend a small part of the day with you, but aims to make a big impact in your learning when she shares her story on what the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation means to her. So welcome, Patricia. It's so nice to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. And we're good, right? Perfect. Looks great. Okay. So I, I'm not sure to say good morning for sure. Good afternoon for sure, but not good evening. Could be. Some of us might be evening. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do, so one of the things that I'm doing for my truth and to uh, make sure that I have uh, my space is that I am a second language learner and I am not fluent. So every chance that I get to, to be, to work towards that fluency, I do. So Dante Patricia St. Dennis Sigasun, Kamenistigu Manaiguskak Uchi Nina, Nigui Egote Uchi, Eguamaga Kaptegona, Wigian, Muskegne now Isquel Nina, Uskinigini no Treaty Nian Aski Uchi, Egua Indusis, U e Giskinamai Tatian Uskichi Kayas. Hello, my name is Patricia St. Dennis, and I am from Cumberland House Cree Nation in Treaty 5 territory. Part of the introduction is that I am a real strong um, a, Cree, a, a swampy Cree woman uh, from Treaty 5 ter ter territory, and that is where my mom is from, like I said in the introduction, and that is part of my introduction also when it comes to um, reclaiming my language, because the most important thing that I've been told from elders that I've been told from people around me is introducing yourself and letting people know where you come from is the most important thing as an indigenous, as an indigenous person. Even to the point of when I said Patricia St. Dennis Nitsigasun, that Nitsigasun talks about the belly button, the belly button of the connection between a baby that's growing inside a mother's womb 
to the to the belly button, the, to the umbilical cord that uh, connects to the mother. That's how important it is for you to be able to say where you come from and to introduce yourself like that. So, and then I asked my my uh, I have uh, in our culture there is a word called wagutuin, and that's family, that's kinship, that's the ties to the people that are around you. So your aunties and your uncles become your moms and your dads and your cousins become your sisters and your brothers. So I asked one of my aunties, my second mom, I would say, and I said, auntie, what is a word that you don't really hear anymore in our, in our um, language? And she had said, uskichi, uskichi. And sometimes certain words that we use could have multiple meanings for different things. But in this place, with it being the um, sentence that she helped me um, um, be able to say is that it is a stovepipe that comes out of the trapper's tent or those white canvas tents that we would take a long time ago in the trap lines. And it is the stovepipe that's connected to the belly stove that would keep that tent nice and warm. She says, I really don't hear that word anymore. So you are looking at the very uh, first page of my presentation, and these are my nieces and, and my nephew. You would say that, and I would say that these are white passing Indigenous kids. They go to our small rural school in Paradise Hill. And I remember going into Paradise Hill and remembering about the truth and reconciliation. And I purposely went around and I thought, could my nieces and my nephew or my daughters and my son actually see themselves in that school and I looked really really hard and unfortunately I didn't see as much or very little of what should be seen in a school so you know I built a relationship and um, with Paradise Hill School, and I gave a presentation like this to Paradise Hill School. We, I went in, and I sh and part of my story is to talk about ribbon skirts. And I uh, spent the day with Paradise Hill School and the teachers, and we learned about things. and And they continue to do those kinds of things. Say so it was just the visualness that if I was to go rock in any school, I always look to see if Indigenous students are going to be able to feel that they belong there. So it's all about belonging. Belonging is so important. So I'm going to, I'm going to share with you ribbon skirt learning. It has been to me a really huge component of truth and reconciliation for myself. So I'm going to share a personal narrative that is going to be with story because story to me is extremely important. It is the way that I place myself in space and place. And the power of story is the way that our Indigenous people shared information we transferred knowledge and that power of story then not only are you here with your ears and you may hear it with your eyes, all of your senses, it is stored in your heart and your, and your heart is full of blood, which pumps all around your body. And we say that our knowledge system is, is transferred from generation to generation through a cellular memory, through the passing of our blood. So I'm going to let you know about my power of story for truth and reconciliation, and it is then my truth. And this picture here is with um, some colleagues. Now, you're saying, well, what are you doing? It that kind of looks like you're kind of holding hands, you know, and you don't maybe see that very much in colleagues. And we base our work, we base our relationships, very, very important part of the introduction that Rebecca had so eloquently did is that in land language relationships and culture, that's where I find my truth. That's where I base my personal and my work life. And having love for the people that are around you is very important. So this is right here. Uh, um, at the time, senior director, superintendent, and at the time, I was superintendent. So we had, we, you know, developed a very, very close relationship, because it's meaningful to do that. I just wanted to show you that also, because we're all wearing ribbon skirts. And every one of those, those three ribbon skirts, I made them. Okay. So what kind of started um, my journey then about looking at my ribbon skirts for a way of healing? And it all kind of started on 
in March 2020, when the world shut down and COVID had hit. And I'm a person that just loves to be around people. I love to interact, you know, build those relationships. I love to laugh. And um, in March of 2020, we weren't allowed to do that anymore. We needed to be home. And some, you know, information came out and uh, we learned about some things about our community that not everybody, not everybody really truly understands some of the things that and the way that Indigenous people celebrate and the way that we look at showing our best makes us feel really powerful. And then that is with Isabel Kulak. Isabel Kulak was a, a, a young girl, 10 years old. She was told to dress up formally for an engagement at her school. And she did. She walked into a school with a ribbon skirt. Some people there didn't think that that was very formal and told her, told her so. Well, the next day, in, well, not the next day, in that next little while, I think that following Monday, there was, an, I would say, a nice little small little army of loving Indigenous women that were going to show, you know, this is formal wear to us. This makes us feel beautiful. And this makes us feel wonderful. And I feel that uh, there were a number of things that from that truth and reconciliation, yeah, we got September 30th as a day of reflection when we should be reflecting every single day, right? As we learn, we should be reflecting even in, in our work life, we should, in our, um, sorry, our school life, and then we should be looking at it also in our personal life and the relationships that we have around, you know, around people and in our community. So it went viral it went viral and we, and it was like every single person in indigenous country the clans the tribes the treaties all stood behind isabel kulak and we have a we have now um a ribbon skirt uh day and i feel that every single day whether or not it is for missing murdered indigenous women which i'll talk about or whether or not it's for isabel kulak we have a reminders and i feel that they are good for not only for us but also for our allies and our friends that are not of the same descent as us and when when you think about ribbon skirts for myself and when i feel the most powerful the, the one of the, when we come together and do some celebrations, it happens at a round dance. And I hope that we have um, people in here that have gone to round dances. And I hope that um, if there is a curiosity for students to go to a powwow, you know, you put that on your bucket list because it is amazing. You feel Indigenous or non-Indigenous, you feel so special when you see all those beautiful um, Indigenous people in their regalia. They're not called costume. They're not called outfits. They're called regalia. And the beautiful colors and the meanings. Um, I know that in, in my family, we do have some powwow dancers. And through ceremony, so through ceremony, they're given colors. So you can make it, you know, um, when you see those power dancers, that those colors were given to them through prayer and through ceremony. So I, like I said, I make ribbon skirts and it's for a number of things for myself. It was, it's for healing, just hearing that sewing machine um, and just thinking about the things that I wanted, that I want to make for myself. And it brings me into and it centers myself. And for a lot, uh, and I can almost say as a blanket statement, every Indigenous person has trauma. And I know that everybody in our world has uh, trauma, but we have trauma from colonization. We have trauma from the residential schools. We have trauma, what people would consider in the present, our um, system for our child and family services. You know, they're saying that that's the new residential schools. And so with, with all of those things, you know, being and doing and that ribbon skirt making for me helps me heal from it the sewing machine that I can hear and showing away my, my hurts. And it, it, it's just like, they go away while I'm making something. Cause I always tell myself, if I'm making a ribbon skirt, I've got to be in a good heart. I don't get mad. You know, I don't get testy. If that thread gets all mixed up and it, it's too tight and it breaks all the time, or, you know, something's going, you know, something's not matching up or aligning the way it should. I just remain in that little calmness and then my family around me that hears my um the sewing machine it reminds them of of their grandmother 
um, that, you know, would sew things in, in when they were really, really small. So it's really uh, something really powerful to, to me when I take out my sewing machine, because I live in a small house. So if I'm going to bring out my sewing room, it becomes the sewing room takes space in the kitchen and in the living room. So it's all set out there and everybody can see what's going on and what I'm doing. So it's right in everybody's eyes. And so this is um, my um, first father. It's that this is his wife and she uh, comes from another nation. She comes from Nelson house in Manitoba. And in my heart, if I, you know, the creator, if you have, you have that spirit that talks to you inside and my spirit talked to me and said, you, that skirt that you just made, you go and you give it to Margaret. So I went over and I went to visit my dad and I'm taking my skirt over there. And I made it specifically for missing murdered Indigenous women and girls, which May 5th is the day that we remember. But we should be, like I said, we should be remembering things all the time. And so I gave her that skirt and she just about cried. And so you could see the joy, you know, when I give something away or when I make something, it not only brings me joy and puts love in my heart, but it puts love and joy in other people's hearts too. So I've made well over a hundred skirts, maybe even 120. And I have given more than half of them away in the last three years. Cause I didn't know I could make ribbon skirts. I didn't know that I could create things. Heck, I know, I know that people that are on this call are really good at art if you have to make stickmen. I, that's me. And so for when it was my, you know, when I made things and put applique or pictures on my ribbon skirt, I was so amazed with myself because I could look at something and then draw it on the material and it would just come out so beautifully. And I really put that and I say that that's because when I make ribbon skirts, I'm in ceremony for that. And I'm just going to show you just a tiny little picture of all of the ribbon skirts that I have that I have made for my, excuse me, for myself and, and for um, other people. Like I said, sometimes I intentionally make uh, uh, people ribbon skirts and then others, I just make them and then I just give them away. And that's just a little bit of that, uh, just a little sneak peek and all that applique that you can see on there, like the strawberry there's a, a woman there. Uh, yeah, I guess that would be only two that I had put on there. No, there's one that is another one there that, that's, that's at the very top. And then if you count one, two, three, four in, that skirt is extremely special for me because there is syllabics underneath that woman. See, that's long hair. That's, a, that's me. And underneath it, it says Isquil. And so I wear that. I made that for a group of women that are in um, the my workplace that are in a certain initiative for early learning and the early, le we call them the early learning team. I made everyone matching skirts so that when we would go up to present and talk about early learning, we could all wear the skirts that look the same. All right, uh, like, like Rebecca had said, uh, I just do wanna share a little bit of, uh, um, I, I won. I want something out here. There was a, the, we were doing, um, this is called the Saskatoon Principal Short Course, and this is in 2020. And they wanted us to go and um, send pictures into Twitter. Now, now Twitter's not called Twitter anymore. It's called X, right? And we, so these pictures are coming in and they just want us to show because we're all at home, right? There's no, there's no person to person conferences at that, at this time. Send us a picture of how you're learning. And so I sent this picture because I had set, this is my kitchen table. I had set my kitchen table and my living room into my sewing room while I was listening to speakers and while I was learning. So I was top pick. So I was so excited. And I got a University of Saskatchewan uh, crew neck uh, sweater. And it's like the best. So I just love crew neck sweaters. So I was really thankful when I won that. Deb Halland, Deb Halland got sworn in in um, one of a very historical moment in the United States. And uh, to me, this picture just goes to show and to celebrate that our Indigenous woman through something that is a very ceremoniously in the government world, that these women showed up in their attire 
that shows that they want to give homage to Indigenous women, to their culture. And it just shows, you know, when you see a woman with a ribbon skirt, you are going to make almost an, an assumption that she's an Indigenous person. And just to use, just at that monumental governmental government ceremony, she decided to wear a ribbon skirt. And I just thought that that is absolutely beautiful. You heard me talking about uh, early learning team with the Meadow Lake Travel Council. And so one of the things that we do every single year to kick off our, um, when we come back together after the summer and we have some orientation days and we come back and we talk about programming, the very first day we always sit and we always make ribbon skirts. So these are the completed ribbon skirts that these women had worn. And you can see that early learning team on the on the right hand side. So in back in 2020, Tristan DeRocher um, walked from northern Saskatchewan all the way down to the parliament in Regina. And it was to raise awareness of suicide rates in northern Saskatchewan because there was a bill that was to be passed, but it was it was turned down. So in the 44 votes that were turned down during a government session, Tristan set up a teepee in the Parliament Park and fasted for 44 days. He fasted for every single day for, the, for every single no to pass that bill. And to do something like that is, is ceremony. The, the, the creator is guiding you. You have people coming in from all over Saskatchewan and, 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 and out of the province to show that they support Tristan in what he, what he's, he's trying to prove, you know, a point that, you know, our services in Northern Saskatchewan are very little for mental, you know, for, to work towards that that mental wellness for all, um, all people, but especially our youth. And this costs money to do these kinds of things. And he had people, you know, certain people walk with him the whole way, or people would join with him along the way. And I thought to myself, while I was sitting at home, how, how can I help this? And so this is a skirt that I made. And when I made this skirt, I was able to fundraise $400. And I sent the $400 away to uh, Tristan just to help with food, with, um, you know, fuel for the people that were following him. And that was just my way to go and, um, and support something that is very important. And the bill eventually passed. So, you know, his efforts, um, although, you know, they... Um, it was hard to do the fasting. He did um, did eat, drink like teas and whatnot, um, but just no food. And at the at the end of his uh, fast, Tristan had long, long, beautiful hair. He cut his braid and he put it up on the Parliament door handles. Okay. So some of the things that uh, for myself, like I've said, is this is Nigawi. Uh, Nigawi. Nigawi means my mother, and my mother wanted, uh, and I'm just sharing this so you can get a little bit of a glimpse. My mother um, phoned me up and she said, Patricia, the ribbon skirts that I see that you're making, they're so beautiful. She said, you know, my most favorite color, and I would love a, a ribbon skirt with my favorite colors. And everybody, you can see it's obviously it's purple. And so these, I, if you look at these flowers, we would consider them Métis flowers. And so I cut these Métis flowers out and then I did the embroidery for, and I made that skirt for my mom just to honor my mom. So, you know, she wears that every once in a while in a remembrance of um, her. I She remembers me. But then also when I see her wearing that skirt, it remem I'm, I'm reminded that I, I was doing some healing the, during the time that I was making that skirt. So I, during, during the shutdown, during the COVID, I went through some training and we were learning about trauma and we were learning not only to learn about it, but we were to learn to uh, be, um, we were working towards that liberation, really letting it go. And I had some instructors that profoundly impacted and they resonate with me to this day. And the way that I wanted to show my appreciation from the learning that I got from them is I made these ladies, these skirts 
and I mailed it to where they live so that they would know that their teaching to me was was phenomenal and that I was really grateful. So they gave me, you know, coping skills and they gave me strategies that I call, I say that every single person in this world walks around with an imaginary toolbox and I just walk around and I'm holding it every day. And the things that I learned that are going to help me be better person than I was the day before, I put them in that toolbox. And so the things that they gave me, I went and I exchanged by saying thank you by giving those beautiful skirts to those wonderful people. And now I think that that's about it. I'm just going to open up to see if anybody has any questions. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your stories. Some of them, all of them were very, very um, impactful. So uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing them. I did notice we did get a question in the chat while you were speaking. Is there a boy equivalent of making a ribbon skirt or are boys and men also welcome uh, to make and wear skirts or is it more of a... A female aspect of your culture. Thank you for answering that. I'm just going to say is that in our culture, when we have the two spirited people, they're very they they are honored. They are are looked at to have extreme gifts and healing and and you know that they're just that extra um, that they've they, they've got some extra gifts that the creator had given them. And when it comes to ribbon skirts. I, if you want to wear a ribbon skirt and, and I don't even want to say if you're male or female, the way that you identify, and if you want to put a ribbon skirt on, you put a ribbon skirt on, but there are ribbon shirts that people make. Um, so that, and, and again, it doesn't matter right, for the sex, uh, if you want to wear a ribbon skirt or a, uh, sorry, a shirt, you, you can do that um, as well. The one thing that I do want to say though, is that. How do you honor, and I've had people come and um, ask me this, if I am non-Indigenous and I want to wear a ribbon skirt, can I? And the answer is yes, but there's a but. If somebody comes up to you and says, I really love your ribbon skirt, you take that time to pause and have a little conversation with that person that gave you that compliment to make sure you tell them where you got it from and who made it for you, because then it gives that honor to that person. Yeah, that's a, I, that's a wonderful point because you hate to see people taking aspects of indigenous culture and for lack of a better word, whitewashing them to use them in their own way. So that if you're going to be uh, interacting with this amazing aspect of, of your Korean and your Métis culture to actually share that with the people that are interested in it, I think is super important. Yeah, um, so we'll I see another, another question coming up here. How will you be marking the new TRC statutory day and what are things that students could do in their home? So what are your plans um, for your day tomorrow and what are some things that some of the people joining us today could be doing? Mm, thank you for that wonderful question. And I've been actually consciously thinking about it. So yesterday we had a, um, a career fair and we had uh, our students from our nine nations come down into Meadow Lake. And we had uh, three other nations from the western part, northern part, sorry, eastern, east, the northeast part of Saskatchewan come down to our um, career fair. So all of our staff, the staff that I lead, we all wore orange shirts. Today, I'm in ceremony with you sharing a good story because I believe that when you're when you're sharing story, you're in ceremony. And tomorrow I will be with my daughter uh, because um, she's going to get she's going to get married. So I'm going to spend the day with her and we're going to go bridal dress shopping. So those are the kinds of things that I'm going to be, and I'm going to be with my daughter and my daughter's also an educator. That picture that was right at the beginning, I wanted to show you that, um, like what I had said in the introduction through Rebecca, that there is, um, uh, my whole family has, um, educators galore and my daughter is also a teacher. So I'm going to spend some time with her tomorrow as well. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of things that happen in our, um, our community. So I'll be in Saskatoon. And if we by chance get to go and see something or do something, we most definitely, but, but first we got to try on dresses. Yeah, that's wonderful. What a great way to mark, uh, you know, a family tied holiday. I think that's a wonderful idea. Yes. Um, I also would like to point out as well, 
Um, where I'm located in Edmonton, even just Googling like TRC events in Edmonton, I'm sure you can do it for your own city. There are tons of virtual and in-person events and things that are happening that um, are welcome to everyone. So if you, if anybody watching does not have a plan, there is plenty for you to do. Um, yeah. I have another question here from Chris Colley saying, what are some ways teachers can bring Indigenous perspectives into their classroom throughout the year in a respectful and educational manner? And that kind of reminds me of something that you were saying at the start of your presentation, where you said you go into a school and you look to see if Indigenous students would feel safe and welcome in that space. So I was kind of wondering about that as well. Do you have any kind of tips for, for teachers that are joining us today? Mm, so some of the, and I'll tell you exactly what I was looking for when it comes to the, um, when I would walk into schools, I want to see, do the flags are important and ceremony flags are important. So do I see flags? Do I see the flags of the treaty that you are on? Do I actually see a big, huge picture of the treaty itself? So in our office, we have, um, our pictures of our treaties, six, eight, and 10, um, at that are, are um, one you can see and the other ones are in the midst of being um, hung, hung up. Our flags are showing are shown all the time. I also uh, think that there should be, you know, we can go on to, there's so many different things that uh, right now there is a, um, a movie that just got launched. It's called Bones of Crows. Bones of Crows, you really need to watch. It is a phenomenal, uh, uh, it does. I don't like to use the word trigger. Trigger to me is a violent word, but there are reminders um, if there are Indigenous people that are going to watch Bones of Crows. So just, just be prepared that there will be reminders in a lot of our movies and a lot of, sorry, I, our, our movies, I don't even think, I try to use words that are really powerful. Our stories, some of our stories that are put through movies they um you know they're very emotional so I would do that and in the classroom there are so many websites that you can go to that you know gives those extra um you know that extra information that you could um you know you could use uh, but teachers I get out on the land get out on that land and see about what grows around your land that is medicines to, you know, help with the common cold that could help with inflammatory things that could just, there's so many things that are around that we don't know that are, that our people, my people that would, you know, use them for healing. So that would be, would be another thing. And those um, kinds of things like going to a powwow, going to a round dance, make, having relationships with Indigenous nations that are around towns and cities is very, very good. And uh, to have relationship with knowledge keepers and with elders that could come into your school. We also, um, in Saskatchewan, we are mandated to, to ta um, teach from the treaties in, in the classroom. So there's tons of information that you can use that, um, you know, that you could teach in a respectful and an educational manner. I hope I answered your question, Chris. Yeah, thank, thank you for a great answer and thank you for such a great question. We only have time for a couple more because we did start a, a couple of minutes late. So um, if you have any last questions, now's your chance to get them in the chat. I did have one while um, we're waiting to see if any more come up. Um, you mentioned that you um, have gotten women together and done these um, uh, educational sessions on, on making ribbon skirts. Do you have any... Um, Anywhere that you can send any of the classes or the teachers today that are interested in learning how to do this from from Indigenous women instead of, you know, maybe doing it the wrong way. Well, I know that there are like, for example, on the island in in uh, Victoria Island, Vancouver Island, there's one of the ladies that is from Cumberland House. And it's on the east part of the island. She runs uh, ribbon skirt making all the time. Um, in Edmonton, I know that there's friends that I have on social media that run ribbon skirt making all the time. Your friendship centers that are in uh, cities would run ribbon skirt making. And uh, even just asking around and putting that question out 
it comes out of the woodwork to go and say, yeah, you know what, I can do that. That could be even an evening spent at the library or evening uh, um, spent at the school for somebody that knows how to make make them. And I'm going to say there's no right or wrong way to make a ribbon skirt. It's more about bringing that, bringing those women together to laugh, to, you know, have snacks with and just give them that opportunity for that because I like I said ribbon skirt making is ceremony for me to bring them into that ceremony so that they put their love and their what they like into that skirt and then you know they wear it um at future events or the days that 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 are ahead and that they just you know feel really beautiful when they wear it Awesome. Thank you very much. And I know we have a lot of schools that uh, join our events from Vancouver. So I'm sure that there will be people reaching out to that. And I see we have a, a note going to suggest that as their next PD. Actually, some of my former colleagues up in Cold Lake just did this as their PD session of making ribbon skirts together. So that's wonderful to see. Um, I have one last question that I often like to ask our guests. Um, what would you say would be um, your last takeaway or the big message that you would like our students and our teachers to go home with today after the event? Mm, it's that land language relationships and culture and I'll hone in on relationships. I have in the maybe the last and I'm, I don't know what it did to that COVID. So the last three years is to normalize love. And that love is platonic and that love is to, to bring people to back together. And love to me is full of that kindness and, and is full of that acceptance of the people around you. So normalize love. Please make sure that you tell people that you love them. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate again. Um, the diversity and, and the, the depths of all the stories that you're able to share with us today. Um, and thank you. I hope that the people joining us today um, got as much out of it as I did. I'm sure they did. Um, I have one quick reminder before I do my final thank you, before I let everyone go. I know we're at 45 minutes, but I want to make sure if um, our teachers today um, enjoyed this session, want to have more um, similar options to speak with experts on tons of topics, we have more reconciliation events coming up, but also um, focusing on climate and mental health, um, lots of different things. Um, just do a quick little scan of this QR code. You can see um, uh, option to sign up for our newsletter and that way you won't miss out on any of our, our upcoming stuff. And I wanted to once again, just, just say from the, the bottom of my heart and uh, the team here at CGE, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you um, for being brave enough to, to share all of these stories um, with all of the, the educators and the students that are here with us today. West us. Wonderful. All right. That's it from us. So thank you so much for everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and hopefully we can all um, find some great events to head to tomorrow for our orange shirt day. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a great day.